Greece is a country LSE has long had connections to with students, but also with public affairs. And I think that we desperately need now um, places where Greece as a phenomenon, if you will, can be studied, and preferably studied independently of its connection with the classical past. We think of the Greek contribution to Europe, uh, to the West, our definitions of those things owe so much to uh, Greek history and the Greek uh, inheritance. Uh, currently, significance far outweighed its uh, size and its uh, relative size even within Europe. The Blood Conservatory allows us to connect really great academic research to wider public discussions and the ways in which public policy gets shaped. The Hellenic Observatory has two main aims. It's a research unit and it fosters a public events program. so we focus very much on contemporary Greece from the perspective of the different social sciences. The Greek government has a role. It's a hub, as very important hub for Greece, both for research, for dialogue, for understanding better Greek politics, economics and history. It had and it has an impact in uh, the academic world in Greece and the, in the political public debate. And more importantly, it's a forum of a change for younger scholars and for Europeans who want to learn about Greece. Uh, Greece is in the, at the crossroads of three continents. And actually the interaction between the three civilizations is, uh, in my view, what produced the greatness of Greece. Now, is it an important country to study? Well, for those of us who come from there, ethnically, it's the most important country to study. We are seeking to uh, serve three audiences. One, of course, is uh, the academic community here at the LSE to connect Greece to the interests of other uh, scholars in different departments. Another is the diaspora community of uh, Greece and Cyprus here in, uh, in the UK, which has been uh, very supportive of our activities. But we also naturally wish to speak to colleagues in Greece. The Hellenic Observatory can uh, play um, a more influential role in uh, what we need in Greece. And this is the rational thinking and the rational argumentation. So we can link the British spirit with the Greek spirit. I, I think uh, the Hellenic Observatory should have a, a positive role in uh, analyzing in depth um, the problems that we have faced uh, so far, and also from a distance. The, the debates, the discussions, uh, the policy papers, and so on that have been taken place or produced by the Observatory are very important. And I know that uh, a lot of the decision makers in Greece. Uh, they take this material very, very uh, seriously. For policy makers especially, history matters. If we don't learn from the past, we cannot influence the future. It has played a positive role uh, so far in uh, analyzing critical issues for, for the Greek economy and society and the political system. Uh, so I think it, it has a bright future. In more recent times, uh, of course, Greece has got a global <coughs> sense of the debt crisis and its rescue uh, by the European Union. The problems that Greece has faced before everyone else in the years of our problems that those who founded the uh, principles of the European Union and the institutions just didn't think about it, we didn't have any ways of dealing with it. And therefore Greece has become uh, a case to study on how do we deal with this kind of problem within a monetary union. There must be a focus, particularly during this time of crisis, a focus on the future of Europe and the future of the uh, Euro area. This is important for um, Greece, for Great Britain and for Europe as a whole. It's an opportunity for us, therefore, to, to grow further, to fulfill a bigger mission. And the bigger purpose of the observatory is to uh, not only enhance the international understanding of Greece as it is today, 
but also to engage and connect with our academic peers within Greece to collaborate on research projects. Research projects which see Greece as a case of something bigger, Greece as a part of a comparison with other nations, with uh, the European Union, uh, etc. My vision of LSC is that we're the most global research intensive university in the world, and that means we connect research to public issues everywhere. Globalization is reshaping societies all over, creating challenges, offering opportunities, and the Hellenic Observatory helps us crystallize how that process works in Greece. Good evening, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first public lecture of the Hellenic well, welcome Observatory. To welcome to the third London Review of International Law. It's a good voice, my book. I'm sure I've practiced my words, but I didn't expect that as well. Um, just saying that uh, welcome to the first public lecture uh, of the Hellenic Observatory and the Hellenic Bank Association. Uh, let me first start with a wish to the Hellenic Observatory for the 20th anniversary, all the best, and as an elder association, share some words of wisdom. Age is something that doesn't matter, <laughs> unless you're a cheese. Over 20 years, the Hellenic Banking Association in the UK has attracted the brightest individuals and promoted the interests uh, of young Hellenic origin finance professionals in the city. Effectively, a platform for informational and networking opportunities in the heart of the city that brings together the effort to raise awareness uh, of Hellenic matters and promote both Greece and Cyprus. There is a talented and established professional community in the city of London most of whom have been students of the Lotus School of Economics and Kevin's, who we thank for the hospitality and the long-term partnership. It is an open association to ideas, new challenges, new members that share the same professional background and promote the open two-way dialogue, irrespective of political uh, views and economic conditions. The aim is to create a spark for thought, vo voice common sense, bring content, uh, such as presented via public lectures, such as this one, as well as other high-profile private events, uh, attention attended by investment and banking professionals uh, in, the, in the city of London, with business and government leaders uh, from Greece and Europe. The Greek crisis, the recent Greek crisis, has attracted a lot of attention. The risk systems have been adjusted to uh, accommodate for Brexit. Macroprudential and fiscal theories have been put to test. Microeconomic management theories and systems have been redrafted and are currently restructuring. And generally, we're, we're living in a world that ever changes and it evolves. The Greek crisis, de facto, is a case study for the future generations. It is also an opportunity for the Greeks to redefine themselves in the global scene. We thank Professor Caselli for her contribution and we look forward to his speech tonight. Well, thank you. Let me give you uh, our warm welcome from the Hellenic Observatory. Um, let me say at the very beginning that I'm told that this week is the rag week for the LSE. And I think this evening as you leave the theatre, there will be a charity collection for three extremely good causes. St. Mungo's Broadway, which deals with the homeless in London, Papyrus, uh, which deals with preventing young suicides, and Farm Africa, obviously uh, developing uh, food uh, supplies in Africa. So I hope you will give uh, generously for these very good causes, 
and the collection will be taken as you leave the lecture theatre. But uh, let me say that we're very pleased to be uh, holding this uh, lecture again with the Hellenic Bankers Association. And I thank Andonis Statsopoulos for his uh, words of welcome. As you've seen in the, our new video, uh, this year is the 20th anniversary of the Hellenic Observatory, and we plan a full program of public events uh, in Greece, in Cyprus, and here in London. And you'll be able to get information about those events uh, from our uh, website. Tonight, we're delighted to uh, start our program of events, our first major event of 2016, uh, with our lecture uh, by Professor uh, Katzeli. Now, Professor Katzeli will be known to some of you as the chair of the National Bank of Greece and as chair of the uh, Hellenic Banking Association in Greece. Others will, of you will know that she has served as a minister in the PASOK government to 2009 Indeed, for five years, she also served as a member of parliament. Uh, Professor Katzeli has had a very impressive career, a very varied career. In addition to serving with the bank, in addition to serving uh, governments and parliaments, uh, she's also one of Greece's best-known economists. She is one of the very few Greek economists to have published in the very best economics journals internationally. She obtained her PhD in international development economics from Princeton University. She's taught at Yale University. Indeed, she was awarded the best young professor at Yale. Uh, in fact, she's received many international awards and prizes. She's been both an academic analyst. She's one of the very few uh, Greeks uh, who can command the international profile with her um, comments and uh, analysis. And she's a practitioner, as I've indicated. She's also been a practitioner internationally with the OECD and chairing various international uh, committees. So it is with very great interest that we look forward uh, here this evening to her uh, comments, her answers to the question of the lessons we can learn from the Greek uh, crisis, her combination of academic insights and practitioner experience uh, is exceptional. She's ideally suited to uh, address this uh, question. And of course, as chair of the National Bank of Greece, she's just participated in the recapitalization process of the banks uh, in Greece as well. Later, There'll be plenty of time for your questions and contributions from the uh, audience. But without further ado, and I promise no more videos this evening, uh, no more words of introduction and welcome, can you now please join me in giving a very warm LSE welcome to our speaker this evening, Professor Luca Ketzeli. Let me make sure that I know how to use the PowerPoint. I click here. I click down or here. Okay, great. Well, good evening. Thank you so much for being here. And it's a great pleasure to actually join you all in celebrating the observatory's 20th anniversary. We have all profited from its uh, contributions, and uh, we hope we will profit from them for many years to come. And I would like also to thank the Hellenic Bankers Association for hosting this lecture. Now, the Greek crisis, as you probably know, erupted in 2009, and it's still continuing. Uh, so it was very difficult for me to step back and look at it uh, and try and draw some of the lessons that uh, would be useful for a non-Greek audience. And uh, seeing that many of you are non-Greeks in the audience, I think it might be important, first of all, 
to start by giving a very brief chronicle of the crisis, just the dates and what happened, and then step back and draw your attention to what I consider five important lessons for the future. Because the Greek crisis will be studied, as has already been said, by many policy analysts, by experts, by academics. There will be many PhD theses written on the Greek crisis whether on the origins of the crisis and how did we end up into such a mess, or whether the cure was an effective cure and whether the cure was more toxic than the disease itself. And last but not least, whether the EU institutions responded the way they did and whether they, and they should, and what can we learn for governance both at the national and the international level and the European level. So uh, it's an open uh, subject, subject for debate, and I hope that you will find useful some of the lessons, some of the insights that at least I draw as I look back into the crisis. So let me just summarize, go through the three phases of the crisis very fast, just to remind you of some facts before I go into the first lesson. Well, it's interesting to note that already in 2009, there was a council decision, a EU council decision, on the existence of an excessive deficit in Greece. So the excessive deficit was not news, it was not something that erupted in 2010, it was already in, by two, in 2009. And there was a recommendation on measures to correct the excessive deficit by 2010. Now, 2010, we had, 2009, we had elections. Uh, the PASOK government took over October 4, and I had the fortune or misfortune to be the economic minister, econo economy, shipping, and competitiveness. Um, now, in October 20th, uh, the government announced that the actual fiscal deficit was almost double what was the projection from the previous, what was known in the market as the deficit of that of this year. And it turns out that it was brought up to 15% a year later. Now, starting October 20th, between October and December, you had a series of downgrading episodes by the major, by the Fitch, Standard & Poor's, and Moody's, altogether. So actually, based on this announcement, this announcement was almost a signal for downgrading and for the beginning of what I call a speculative attack on the Greek bonds and the, Greek and the euro. Now, by April 28th, the Greek-German 10-year debt yield spread surpassed 1,000 basis points, and this brought us into the May 3rd, 2010, first MOU, since Greece could not borrow from international markets at affordable rates. So the first kind of thing to notice is that over a very short period of time, markets reacted very strongly, the information was there, the energy was building, it's like an earthquake, the energy was building for a long time, but it erupted between October and December and basically culminated by uh, April. Now, the beginning of the uh, kind of May 2010 up to 2011, the first MOU was being implemented. We'll come back to that. The second important date is October 26, 2011 when the, at the Euro Summit, there is a first mention of a, a PSI agreement of the private sector involvement. Uh, in other words, the possibility that there might be a restructuring of private debt held by private investors. And private investors were asked to accept to write off 54% approximately of the face value of Greek governmental bonds they were holding. Now, it's important to note that in the first, and there is a lot of controversy about it, that when the first MOU was signed in May, there was no discussion about a possible debt restructuring. 
and we'll come back to that. The issue of the PSI the P and discussions about PSI started in 2011, but as you can see, its, uh, its completion took two years, and it was only in June 23rd um, of 2013 that you've had the, uh, the, the, the first com successful completion of the first recap. Now, uh, this was a voluntary, uh, a, a voluntary write-off. Uh, in March, therefore, you had the first recapitalization of the Greek banking system, uh, the first strategic assessment of the banking sector, which identified four core banks as viable based on regulatory criteria with the capital needs that are quoted there. June 17, 2012, we had elections. A coalition government was formed under Mr. Samaras. And we had, in June, the successful com completion of the first recap with uh, the HFSF is the Hellenic Financial Stability Fund contributing to the recapitalization for the four banks, another approximately 29 mil billion. And uh, this led us, however, to the second recapitalization a year later in April 2014. Uh, again, new capital needs of about 6 billion uh, euros. Uh, the recap was utterly financed by private sector and by private shareholders with no contribution of the HFSF. And by May 2014, Greece's position was slowly, slowly starting improving with uh, an upgrade from Fitch from B minus to B. Now, this is a period, this is a second, therefore, phase between 2011 2014, where you saw the implementation of the first MOU, the repercussions from the implementation, which we'll see in a moment, but also at the same time the recapitalization of the banks. Now, third period, the situation, as we'll see, the real, on the real economy was uh, becoming worse, uh, and we will see what happened to unemployment, uh, growth rates, etc. cetera. Uh, the, in January 2015, we had general elections. A small party, which was not uh, part of the traditional parties, won on the promise of renegotiating the second MOU. The renegotiations lasted from beginning of January 2015 to June 2015. They almost reached an impasse. And the second MOU expired, and that led to basically a default, uh, which two days earlier, on June 28th, produce a bank holiday and position of capital control. And the practical default came when June, on, at June, on June 30th when Greece missed a payment on its IMF loan and fell into arrears. Now, at that point, you had a crisis, this, uh, which meant that both sides had to decide how to proceed. Uh, the government decided to hold a referendum. Over 61% of the vote voted against the proposed measures by then by the Juncker Commission, the ECB, and the IMF. And that strengthened the hand of the government, which came into negotiations. And on July 13, a third MOU was reached, which I would call the product of a crisis. And uh, that crisis led to the completion of this third MOU, which has very special characteristics, quite different than the first two memorandum of understanding, and I'll come back to that. Now, in July, so capital controls were imposed. The capital controls are still on in Greece. We had a bank holiday. Uh, the bank holiday was lifted uh, in, in, towards the end of July, July 20th. The third MOU was voted and agreed in August. Actually, the day 
after August 15th almost, the major parties in parliament decided to vote in favor of the third MOU. And once this was done, the government called for new elections, which again, it uh, won, and formed a new coalition government, which is now the present day government in Greece. But that led to a third recapitalization of the banks for reasons which I will say in a minute. So over the past two months, three months actually, uh, all of us at the banks had to deal with the recapitalization. All four systemic banks went out in the market to raise funds. It was successfully completed. So this test was over. And now we are looking ahead, hoping for a return to normalcy. And I'll talk about it once I do the analysis. So this is and we had actually on January 22nd, for the first time again, an upgrading of Greece's credit rating by Standard & Poor from B minus, from CCC plus to B minus. So this has been, this have been kind of five or six years which have been quite turbulent with political uncertainty, with economic uncertainty, and uh, with a lot of losses for many, many families and uh, groups of very vulnerable uh, vulnerable groups in the Greek society. What are the lessons that we can learn? And I'll go back now to the analysis. Uh, we have to be highly selective. There are many, many lessons, and I'm sure there are different ways of looking at the experience and at the evidence and at the data. But I chose to focus on these five, which I consider crucial, as lessons for the future. The first one is a more general point that uh, we as academics normally always say, but uh, it's uh, r rare that you see it in practice, that in a small open economy operating in global capital markets, growing twin deficits enhance vulnerability and generate debt unsustainability. And this is a lesson that you better watch out what happens to the, your deficit and your current account, uh, your external balance and your internal balance. And when we talk about twin deficits, you really need to be careful as a policymaker to contain them. The second lesson that I'll come into it has to do with the way that both EU institutions but Greek governments responded to this crisis, which was a systemic debt crisis. And the lesson I draw is that very aggressive, front-loaded, restrictive policies, fiscal and monetary, as we'll see, in a way can undermine the goal that you try to achieve, namely can erode the sustainability of public finances. That how much austerity you impose is extremely important and crucial, and it's very important that it does not destabilize the public finances and the debt situation, as it did in Greece. The third lesson is that the choice in sequencing of accompanying structural reforms is critical. We talk a lot about structural reforms. There are many who say that Greece did not implement structural reforms the way they did. Some others say that the structural reforms were badly designed. In my view, the choice and the sequencing of our reforms had a lot of problems, and we see it, and we see it now as well. The fourth lesson that I'm drawing is that when you do an adjustment program, such as the one that we had in Greece, it's not enough or sufficient to think about fiscal consolidation or debt, restructuring, but you really need to put at the core of the agenda social policy and to have an effective social protection system which is a prerequisite for sustainable public finances. If you want sustainable public finances, you need a social protection. So the basic point of the agenda 2020, you really need to combine social policy with fiscal adjustment. And last but not least, to manage crisis effectively, 
the EU institutions really need to promote financial stability, but in a way consistent with decent livelihoods and democratic legitimacy. And if we're going to think forward about Europe and the future of Europe, we really need to rethink the growth and stability pact in conjunction with democratic legitimacy and what it implies for politics in our member states. So let me briefly and go and substantiate kind of each of the points and each of the lessons that I've drawn so far. The, going to the first lesson, that in a way in a small open economy growing twin deficits enhance vulnerability and generate debt on sustainability. Well, Greece had allowed itself to become vulnerable. And the main factor behind in my view, the, the main cause of the crisis is this competitiveness gap, which actually is the main problem, which is a persistent problem since the early 90s, if not earlier. It was it deteriorated in 2008, 2009, but the fact is that the growth model that Greece adopted following the Second World War was one where Investment was primarily in the non-tradable sector, in construction activities, most notably. Consumption rose fast, but there was much less attention on the productive restructuring, on the expansion of the productive base, on competitiveness in world markets. And you can see that if you look at the trade balance, if you look at the current account balance, if you look uh, at the competitiveness gap. This is an indicator which show, which, which uh, shows both that this has been a permanent feature of the Greek economy since the 90s. It's actually it's, uh, an indicator of how much Greek exports underperform relative to what would be expected for a country of its size and the distance between itself and each of its partners, namely according to, a, uh, it's, uh, for the more technical ones, it's according to a standard gravity model they have some projections as to what it should export and what it actually does, and it's a me measure of this competitiveness gap relative to its major trading partners. Now, so budget and current account deficits were unsustainable and allowed Greece to become vulnerable to a speculative attack which policymakers delayed to take timely actions. Now, when we see the figures, and we'll see it in a minute, you'll see that external debt rose rapidly after 1998, especially following Greece's entry into the Eurozone in 2002. Actually, by having Greece entering into the market, uh, into the Eurozone, uh, the market itself underestimated the risks of, the, of Greece or of member states, and actually, both foreign banks and Greek banks continued to lend as if Greece was Germany. So you had, uh, you can see in this graph, I don't know if I have, you'll see the deficit is the purple line, uh, starting from 2000, a big deterioration of the general government deficit. This is the uh, purple line. And you see around the same time, uh, kind of rapid increases in both uh, uh, general government debt and the external debt of Greece. So you had, these are kind of uh, features of the twin deficits that I've been talking about. Now, this prompted the markets, and we have evidence right now that already in 2007, people were taking open positions against a possible default. Allow me to say something which was a personal note. In 2007, I was in Parliament. I got a call from two fund managers. Uh, it was not yet known that the deficit would be that, at that level. And I was asked by them, how many bonds did the ECB hold, Greek bonds, and if I thought there was a risk for the euro? It was 2007, two years prior to the crisis. They were already taking positions. 
uh, against Greek bonds. And at the same time, they were covering themselves through CDSs. So the speculative attack came as soon as the signal was given. And by 2000, the end of 2009, first quarter of 2010, actually spreads, rose, as I said before. So the speculative attack against the Greek sovereign bonds erupted between December 2009 and April 2010, making it impossible for Greece to enter and raise funds in the international markets. Now, someone would ask, could, it, could, could something have been done then? Yes, it could have been done if the ECB had the mandate to intervene in secondary markets. The ECB did not have the mandate to intervene in secondary markets and stem the speculative attack. They couldn't. And actually, new institutions such as the EFSF were created as a result of the Greek crisis. So speculators who had proceeded since 2007 to cover themselves against a possible default through purchases of CDSs unloaded Greek sovereign bonds. And you can see the spreads up to 2008. They were practically zero. And then you had sharp rises in the yields and the spreads, making it impossible for Greece to raise funds from the market. So first lesson, watch out. Watch out the twin deficits and your competitiveness gap. Whether you are an emerging economy, whether you're Greece in the Eurozone, and being in a Eurozone does not cover, does not mitigate that risk. Markets seed and take action. Let's go to the second lesson. How do we address a systemic crisis of that proportion? Well, what happened in terms of the EU institutions and the Greek governments? Well, the Greek, the, the crisis was interpreted basically as a fiscal crisis. So you've had austerity measures and an economic adjustment program that was probably the most severe that it has happened. It certainly, uh, the, the adjustment that took place has been unprecedented. During, between 2009 and 2015, you had very large fiscal and current account rebalancing. You had the decline of the primary fiscal balance of approximately 10%. The primary fiscal balance is when you take out interest rate payments. And the current account balance of about 13%. And I have at the lower part all of the other countries that underwent an economic adjustment program. And you can see that Greece achieved the fastest and most intense fiscal correction and adjustment that, or among all these countries with an improvement of the fiscal balance by of approximately 17% of GDP. Well, that fiscal consolidation, which was front-loaded in an economy which is primarily consisting of very small firms, had major repercussions on the level of economic activity, on unemployment, and on living standards. In fact, the repercussions were even more severe because at the same time, you had a dramatic reduction of liquidity in the real economy. We went from positive extension of credit of about 25% to negative, and the liquidity squeeze continued continue throughout this period. So what would you expect to happen? Well, we see it's a classic example of where you see the repercussions of a, such a severe front-loaded adjustment program where both fiscal policy and monetary policy become very, very contractionary. Real GDP growth fell. Greece lost 25% of its GDP, a fifth of its GDP in a very, very short period of time. Why were these results so... Um, because we had many debates with the Troika 
about the repercussions of that program. And the structure of the economy matters. When you have small firms like the Greek economy does, basically they survive if they cover fixed costs plus a markup. The moment the demand falls below a given level, they all shut down. So we had 250,000 firms closing down in less than five years, which is something that in the negotiations, the Troika had a Northern European model in its head, that you would have large firms whose profitability would go up and down so that they would adjust, and they would have prices adjusting as well. Well, prices in Greece, as we will see in a minute, did not adjust. Wages were cut, but prices were not adjusting. Why? Because when you have such a structure in the Greek economy, small companies try and keep their prices up as much as they can before they close down. So there was no price adjustment. The adjustment came through closures of firms as opposed to price adjustment. At the same time, in each, as we will see, in each of the sectors you have competition policy is weak. You have two or three or large firms having more than 60 and 70 percent of market shares. So you, had, you did not see a reduction in prices, but a reduction in real incomes. Well, the recessionary impact of fiscal consolidation increased the gross public debt to GDP ratio by 48 percentage points of GDP. The debt to GDP ratio, the whole objective of the exercise was to mitigate and to address debt, the debt overhang. Well, the debt to GDP ratio was about 120% in 2009. It's now, today, about 200%. Because the GDP has been, the denominator has been shrinking. Debt, short term debt has increased. So the debt to GDP ratio has deteriorated. And uh, so you've had a negative uh, repercussion as a result. And one of the big byproducts of this, the design of the austerity package has been non-performing loans, which rose from December 2007, which were 4.5% of our portfolios, to 42% of our portfolios in all the four systemic banks. Now, why is that? And why do I link this to the second lesson? Because austerity policies, a severe austerity package, such as the one uh, that Im implemented in Greece, basically makes people and families unable to pay. And being unable to pay when you have a wage cut of 40% and a pension cut of 70%, that undermines public finances. They are unable to pay banks. They are unable to pay taxes. They are unable to pay social security contributions. And the reason, one of the reasons that we have pension reform once again being discussed today is exactly a consequence of the way the package was implemented. The fact that social security contributions have been going down and down and down as firms have closed and also people cannot pay and employers cannot pay their social security contributions. Okay, third lesson, the choice and sequencing of structural reforms is critical. I have a histogram here. It's, it's actually um, in academic circles. We normally say that, okay, we need fiscal consolidation, but we need at the same time to do structural reforms, and these would be pro-growth. And if only Greece could have implemented the structural reforms as effectively as it did its fiscal consolidation, the growth effects might have been different. Well, what's the international evidence on structural reforms? There is a very good paper which uh, 
for all of you, for those of you who are economists, I would ask you to read by Babechki and Campos in the Journal of Comparative Economics, saying, does reform work? An econometric survey of the reform growth puzzle. And they basically, what they look at the uh, uh, 46 papers kind of with all the records on structural reforms, and different types of reforms, and they see what is the international evidence on structural reforms, even those which are implemented very, very well on growth. Well, it turns out that they do not report uh, significant and positive effects of reforms on growth. Reforms work on the eff efficacy of markets, but they don't, they are not pro-growth on average, okay? There are differences, there is, there, it's a normal distribution, but the, the mean of that histogram is around zero. So in general, we would not expect structural reforms to have a short-run pro-growth effect. Now, in the case of Greece, you had a different problem or a worse problem, that many of the reforms which were structural reforms or called structural reforms were anti-growth, not pro-growth. And they were fiscal measures in disguise. Let me take, uh, give you an example. The Greek labor market reform agenda is a telling example of the distortions that could ensue as a consequence of improper policy design and sequencing, largely due to an inadequate understanding of the macroeconomic environment in which these reforms were introduced and the structural features of the economy on which they were applied. Well, what did they do? Actually, Andiwani Liberakis has a very good paper on the labor market reform. Uh, I finished a paper, an econometric paper, on the impact of these reforms on competitiveness. Uh, the Greek labor market reform agenda um, basically worked on rights at work. The minimum wage was reduced. Working hours, there was int the introduction of intermittent, temporary, part-time employment. There was a structure of collective agreements was changed. Uh, the uh, more favorable provisions that existed for the extension of contracts were cut. So there was no more automatic extension of sectoral agreements. A probationary period was severed, um, et cetera, et cetera. There were a series of measures supposedly to enhance the flexibility of labor markets. Now, the interesting part of this, I happened to be at that time also labor minister following, uh, so we had a lot of negotiations on the labor market reform agenda. And I was kind of in public, I was arguing then that if you do horizontal measures to enhance the flexibility of labor markets by reducing wages across the board for everyone or introducing temporary employment, intermittent employment at a time of a crisis where all employers face that problem, what you would see is a ma massive reduction or further reduction of income and disposable income across the economy, which is exactly what you saw. And um, at the same time, you did not have the positive effects which you would expect if you had a different configuration of firms because as demand expectations and income expectations were very, very low, nobody, firms did not want to invest just purely because of the cost uh, improvement. The, 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 the demand reduction was so strong and the closures so strong that basically this was an uh, income redistribution from wages to profits without any improvement in other investment or employment. So you see here that as a consequence of the fiscal consolidation, the monetary squeeze and the labor market reforms, you had severe horizontal wage and pension cuts and income cuts, 
wages were reduced by approximately 30%, and the gross amount of non-farm sector pensions were reduced by approximately 50%. And there is a reference by Tinos here in 2013. And you see here the comparison between Greece, which is the blue line, Germany, uh, Portugal, and Spain. The adjustment that took place in the internal devaluation, if you want, in the Greek economy was enormous, to a large extent also due to the structural reforms. Also, the same can be said about government sector reforms. <coughs> we need a government sector reform in Greece, but the government sector reform was associated with firings, hundred to, to have dismissals. So this, again, had recessionary impact effect as opposed to restructuring or an administrative reform. So the ensuing recession and the adverse profitability have offset the potentially beneficiary impact of internal devaluation on employment, on private investment, and competitiveness. And we see here unemployment rising from 2009 to about 27% in recent years. Investment dropping by 11 percentage points, and this is the biggest problem we have. It used to be about 26% of GDP. It's now only 11% of GDP. Savings are negative. And competitiveness, very interesting. If you measure competitiveness, which you see in all reports, based on unit labor costs, there is an improvement in competitiveness, in price competitiveness because wages fell relative to our partners. If you measure it, however, in terms of final prices, in fact, you've had a much smaller improvement in terms of final prices. You had a depreciation of the real exchange rate by only 6% since 2009. Pr why? Because at the same time, you had tax increases and energy cost increases. So the choice Third lesson is that how you structure structural reform. What we mean by structural reform is extremely important. How we sequencing is important. And that brings me to the last point under this lesson, that it was a big surprise that whereas over the first five years we focused on labor market reforms, very little was done on product market reforms. Neither the Greek government nor the Troika place them on their high policy agenda. And what does this mean by putting them as prior actions? So product market reform, meaning that increasing the competition in each sector, um, this was never put uh, high on the agenda. And this has changed under the third memorandum. Well, fourth, and I have to go a little bit faster, Fourth lesson, the results would have been different if at the same time that the fiscal consolidation took place and the structural reforms took place, there was uh, actually a social protection net or attention to the social policy. Well, the reduction in disposable incomes and the firm closures meant that more than 44% of Greeks were at risk of poverty in 2013. And the average household consumption expenditure went down by almost 32% since 2009. We've had a humanitarian crisis actually evolving, which had political repercussions. So the results in 2015 did not come out of the blue. It was very much tied to an austerity package that, in my view, was ill-designed and uh, not carefully thought through. With 400,000 families with children and no working parents, and as I said, with many, many of the firms kind of completely cutting out. Now, this, the dramatic fall in disposable incomes exacerbated the public finances. And you can see it by looking at the delinquent obligations for small and medium-sized enterprises, which actually uh, went up 
tremendously. Uh, since households and firms' capacity to pay taxes, social security contributions, and debt obligations was severely kind of cut. Fifth and last lesson. The reason, you know, one of the questions that uh, kind of an independent or analyst would look like it would be, well, couldn't these be thought through? Do we have as a Eurozone or as an EU the capacity to analyze the conditions in member states and take kind of early action and so on? Well, I think the Greek crisis is, uh, and the way it has been managed, I think is a very, very interesting example for many political scientists, policy makers, experts, and so on to look at the role of institutions and how institutions work. Now, the thing that to me has been more interesting is the multi-layer uh, uh, decision-making process in the EU, which in a way incapacitates EU institutions from making strategic decisions. <laughs> well, you have an intergovernmental process which is extremely lengthy, and it's inadequate to mitigate systemic crisis. Now, there is a lot of discussion about revamping EU institutions, and if we're not going to have, the Greek crisis is not the last crisis to have, uh, we will have future crises. We will need to have, at the European <coughs> level, the Council is based on intergovernmental processes. We need really to address how we uh, mitigate crises, whether they are debt crises, whether they are speculative attacks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and what is the institutional setup that would best uh, work in this direction. Secondly, one of the problems has been the very weak democratic accountability of the Troika itself in program countries at the national level. The IMF has a long tradition with standby agreements. In the, at the European level, we've never had that experience. So you really need to build some mechanism uh, which ensures democratic accountability. And to give you an example, it seems to me that the, one of the first things that needs to be done is any troika needs to be every three years change. It's very difficult to have the same people monitor their own doings and evaluate their own doings. And it's not a coincidence that you had an evaluation from the IMF being a kind of much more an independent evaluation, but we've not managed as yet to have an independent evaluation on the part of EU institutions. There has been a Europarliamentarian um, report, but the institutions themselves have not developed the capacity to actually monitor and evaluate uh, what is being done. A third point is a potential conflict of interest within the Commission between its role in the Troika and its responsibility as guardian of the treaties, especially in policy areas such as investment promotion, social co cohesion, and social policy. There is no mutualization of risks in the Eurozone, and this needs to be enhanced, whether there is a lot of discussions on the table as to how to do that, and we could discuss some of them. The same goes with the ECB. It has a supervisory and regulatory role, which is expanding very fast with the banking union now. At the same time, it's part of the Troika. And right now, the ECB is trying to get itself out of that role in the Troika, primarily because it exercises a very different role. So there are conflicts. We still we don't have an architecture which makes it's a coherent architecture both for risk mitigation but also for uh, enhancing growth and social cohesion in the Eurozone. And of course, because the EU institutions uh, have played that role in many of the program countries, Euroscepticism, and not only, Euroscepticism is growing very fast. And I would say uh, now with the refugee crisis, not only in program countries, but in different countries where you see the same problems in terms of how do we decide, what's the process by which we decide, what are the goals that we... And you see here 
the the negative image of the EU, which to me is very is a, a very staunch European, is very disturbing. Uh, when I see Europeans having a negative image of the EU growing so fast from about kind of to 22%. Okay, let me finish by looking ahead. These were highly selective five lessons that at least I draw as I look back. Now, I said at the beginning of my talk that the third MOU, which uh, was a, involved a bailout of 86 billion for the next three years, was more and is more manageable, both politically and economically, than the two previous ones, with a reduced recessionary impact. Now, it's interesting, nobody says that in Greece. And uh, uh, because nobody has an incentive to say that, uh, the, neither the Commission, nor the Greek government, nor the opposition. Uh, in my view, it's a natural byproduct of the crisis that when things came into an impasse, both parties on both sides had to give in. And actually, the compromise that was reached in the third MOU, in my view, could be much more manageable and could provide a way out. Why do I say that? I say it because you have reduced primary surpluses, which are realistic, which can be achieved. Secondly, you had, and we saw that, bank recapitalization provisions uh, with putting aside 25 billion for the recapitalization. None of that was used, M much less was used, but uh, the recapitalization was took place and it was a successful process despite the losses that it incurred. The third is that in this MOU, you have a transformation of the, uh, of the privatization fund and the creation of the uh, Hellenic Republic Asset Development Fund to monetize assets over 30 year period as opposed to a very short period of time to meet loan repayments to the ESM, debt to GDP reduction, and investment needs, and that's important. Allow me to say something that people don't realize. Of the 360 billion that have been extended to Greece as bailouts over this period, which is enormous if you think, only 11% of that amount has been used for the support of the Greek budget. Uh, all of the rest has been to pay back creditors and to recapitalize banks. So these were not grants, these were loans, and these were loans to repay creditors. And there is, uh, I hear in some public debates that, uh, you know, the people talk as if they were grants and as if they were given to Greece, to the Greek coffers. They were given to Greece, but to repay creditors, which is uh, slightly different. Now, for the first time in this third MOU, you had priority given to product market reforms, combating tax evasion, expansion of the tax base, and pension reform. And Last but not least, there is an agreement that following the first evaluation, which is due in a couple of months, you'll have debt renegotiations to be initiated, uh, which would lead to a lesson, kind of less burden from the debt. Now, let me say something here, that debt restructuring is very much in the public debate. Hmm and the need whether it's sustainable or not. The IMF has taken a position that the debt is unsustainable. Now, I've looked very carefully at the numbers. Strictly speaking, under specific assumptions about growth, et cetera, et cetera, existing debt could be sustainable. That does not mean, however, that debt restructuring is not essential. In my view, debt restructuring is essential for a very, very different reason, as a signal to investors. 
It's a signaling device and a trust building device following the first evaluation. It would give the possibility of investment coming back. Last but not least, what are the goals? I think Greece is a country of opportunities. It needs to be rebranded. And to do so, we need to tackle, to capitalize on our strengths and tackle the major challenges. What are the strengths? We are the crossroads of three continents. There are very important geopolitical considerations which make us a very important location. And you can see that from the interest of many of our partners. There is a strong comparative advantage in many different sectors, agri-food, tourism, real estate, shipping, culture, which we've never seen it as actually as an asset. Very highly educated and skilled and innovative labor force, renewable energy sources, and a lot of potential, an untapped potential. We need, however, to have some very, to, to, to meet major challenges. And I go back to the first slide. To me, the most important one is the competitiveness gap. The competitiveness gap. And to meet the competitiveness gap, you need to increase investment, I would say, by about 10 percentage points over the next five to 10 years. And that should be, especially in the tradable sectors of the economy, especially in the export sector of the economy. And to do so, this should drive the reforms that we need. And the MOU, the third MOU, should be embedded into an agenda for investment promotion, which can be done and is doable. And to do so, we need to reduce the cost of doing business, to do major institutional reforms and regulatory reforms, both on the tax side and on the regulatory system, to speed up the resolution of disputes by courts, and certainly to improve the quality of governance and public administration through very specific, highly selective policies. I think it's doable. I think we could return to normal. We need the will and the persistence and the partnerships to do it. Partnerships across public and private sector, partnerships and an understanding across parties and the political spectrum, and more importantly, a mobilization of both young and middle-aged and older Greeks to rebrand Greece, and to rebrand Greece from a problem to a land of opportunities. Thank you very much. Before I sit down, let me put the light slide down and end up with a nice idea. Uh, we start February 1st as National Bank of Greece. The Act for Greece platform is a crowdfunding platform across the globe so that Greeks and foreigners from Australia to the US to the UK can actually tip and help projects across seven thematic areas, from culture and cultural entrepreneurship to social economy and social entrepreneurship to health and social protection to um, environment, research and uh, social and young entrepreneurship and uh, athletics. Uh, so I would urge you, February 1st at 12.30, to hook on to Act for Greece, because we are starting with three major projects, one for providing food to schools in western Attica, secondly, uh, with the, uh, provide um, health services to refugees and uh, vulnerable groups in the eastern Aegean islands, and third, for the digitalization of the uh, archives of, from 1821. Now, we are working, all of the major, major institutions, 
National Bank of Greece, the Onassis Foundation, the Latsis Foundation, the Bodosakis Foundation, the CSR Hellas, all of the uh, companies which are in this network, and also the UNESCO. And we are joining forces to act for Greece. Thank you very much. There were times during the lecture when I was wondering whether we were going to end on a positive note, uh, hope, but you certainly uh, did that. Uh, I'm going to take a group of uh, questions. There are colleagues with uh, microphones. Perhaps you could simply indicate with your uh, hands and ask a question. No time for speeches. Qu uh, quick question. Uh, we'll take the gentleman in the blue shirt in the middle here, please. Hello, uh, Nick Theodoropoulos, Master in Comparative Politics. Congratulations for your speech. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, the third program is uh, politically and economically more stable, but uh, yes, but uh, how can that be possible with a majority of 153 members of the parliament supporting the current government and with so many uh, difficult measures to come. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, can we take the gentleman with his hand up here, please? Bernard Casey of LSE and one time of the Hellenic Observatory. Um, you spent quite a lot of time talking about what one needs to do in such circumstances, what one should do. But the real question is, how did it happen in the first place? And what lessons can we learn about not letting things like this happen before? A lot of this being promoted by too much ambition on the part of European elites and on the part of those who failed and didn't want to see things which were very clear before their eyes for quite a long time. Thank you. Uh can we take the gentleman at the very back, please? Yes. Uh, two very brief questions. The first question is, George Soros recently said that there is no hope for Greece unless uh, it goes back to the drachma. Have you ever considered this, this as an option all these years? The second question is, uh, the country goes at the moment through a quite bumpy period with strikes and, and so forth. Could you give us, especially to the younger people in this audience, uh, uh, some arguments for, of hope? Why, why should somebody return to Greece, invest in Greece, and, and, and so forth in this environment of high taxation and all these challenges? OK. Uh, there are lots of questions. Perhaps you could answer those three very quickly. Small questions. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, first of all, uh, the MOU uh, was voted by m most major political parties in Parliament in August. Um, now, the, the parties, and so far, about 70 to 80 percent of the program has gone through, at least on the legal side, through, 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 the, through Parliament. What, there are two major tests ahead, the pension reform and the, um, the fund, the new fund. Um, in my view, despite the strikes, uh, which are to be expected, uh, I would say if I were to bet, I would say that the pension reform would go through parliament and with, with revisions as a consequence of the negotiations that take place both with social partners, both with different groups, and with the EU institutions. And I think there is enough pressure on all political parties which have adopted the third MOU and voted for the MOU to contribute towards uh, the implementation of the measures subject to revisions. So this is, if you want, the art of politics, 
trying to manage diverse groups and bring them together. Very good. Now, if, if I could just interrupt, um, you mentioned the word, I would bet. Would you, what's the probability you think that the government will still be in power in the summer? <laughs> what is your bet? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't see actually I, I think You're that I would, put, I would I would be optimistic. Okay. Um, now, now I don't about Mr. Soros. Actually, before coming here, I was at the Hard Talk at BBC and gave an interview. They asked me exactly the same thing, and I said I don't agree with Mr. Soros. Um, and um, actually, uh, it seems to me that given that the being in the eurozone with the whole cost of being in the Eurozone has already been uh, borne by uh, many, many groups. Uh, right now, it would have been crazy to, to get out of the Eurozone, in my view. It doesn't make any sense on economic grounds, uh, especially at a time when uh, uh, you are still in the midst of a crisis or where the crisis is, is evolving. Um, now, how did it happen? Uh, why were European elites and what were the failures? Let me say that in 2007, um, I, we, we were in the opposition then, and actually I had a very interesting debate with an EU official at that time, very high level, I won't say his name, and basically presented the numbers where the general government deficit was actually at that time way above uh, what was the official forecast. And there was no, on the part of the EU institution, there, was, there is a complacency that actually um, we should not rock the boat. And it comes up to the fifth lesson that I draw, that we need, it's not enough to have a growth and stability, uh, a growth and stability program, which then we can uh, change as we go along. Um, there has to be a much more systematic monitoring and evaluation uh, of what's going on, include in that issues having to do with competitiveness and the real economy and social protection. Because I think one of the lessons is that fiscal policy itself and contractionary fiscal policy or monetary policy does not, is not the whole thing. Uh, you have, as we saw in Greece, political repercussions if you don't integrate social policy and a social protection flaw into whatever you're doing. So you need policy coherence across different different uh, instruments, which we don't have at this point. So we really need to think again about how do we revamp institutions, whether we need, for example, um, to, to take some decisions away from the council. I don't think the council is the appropriate risk mitigation uh, uh, governance body. Um, to have some automatic um, instruments to mutualize risks um, and rethink the, government, the governance apparatus. Okay, if we're very quick, we can um, have another I'll round I'll end of... my speech with arguments for hope. You did right? indeed. No, uh, Thank you, Isaac. I repeat, I'm a Greek uh, correspondent in London. Uh, do you think the situation will have been uh, significantly different if the Greek government on the 20th of October 2009 uh, had not gone publicly to say the truth about the Greek economy and probably tried to sort out the problem uh, internally, secretly with uh, EU partners? And you, Luca Casanelli, did you know the truth about the Greek economy before you became a member of the Greek government? In other words, before the elections of 2009. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Others? Uh, can we take the lady here, please? 
Hello, uh, thank you for sharing your insights with us to, um, tonight. I had a question addressed to you more wearing your uh, president of the Hellenic Banking Association hat, um, if I may, and it relates to um, um, non-performing loans. So um, we have seen that you know, you've enacted, there's been new legislation enacted um, at, the, at the end of the year. And I would be uh, interested to, uh, to hear what you think, uh, how effective do you think this is going to be in terms of deleveraging mm -hmm. and fixing mm -hmm. uh, the Greek bank's balance sheets? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, could we take the gentleman in the middle here, please? It's coming. This will have to be the last question. Uh, I'm Platontinius of the Hellenic Observatory. Um, you laid stress on uh, competitiveness as a way out, yet what seems to be apparently unfolding is a major problem uh, program of redistribution. Now, are these two con things consistent? Thank you. Uh, excellent question, short and sharp. Uh, equally okay. brief answers, please. Sure. <laughs> NPLs. Um, the, as you said, we, we are right now, each bank is managing, has special units to manage both mortgage loans, NPLs, uh, consumer and corporate. Uh, actually, the results are already extreme, quite, op quite optimistic because the banks themselves are having new products and doing a lot of restructuring at all, for all these three categories of loans with quite good results. Now, the possibility has been given that some of these have, can be transferred and be managed by third parties. Uh, some banks will take advantage of that. Uh, the difficulty will be on corporate loans, especially syndicated corporate loans, where we need and we are expecting actually a new uh, framework for uh, expediting the procedures because there are long delays in sorting out uh, both the bank's priorities, because each bank has its own priorities, and also restructuring good and viable firms, which are, however, over indebted due to the... So major effort will be done on the corporate side, and we're changing also the bankruptcy law. Uh, so in my view, by after June, you will see, uh, because of the new regulatory framework, uh, quite substantial improvements in, uh, in this account. Uh, now, uh, on redistribution versus competitiveness, uh, look, uh, Danny Roderick, as you say, has done a, a, a thing of, has had a very insightful uh, paper on this, namely that competitiveness alone, you need, you need both. You need to expand and, and restructure your tradable goods sector. But at the same time, you really need to worry about as resources are being uh, drawn out of that sector and are moved, where do they move and whether they are used effectively. So structural change needs to go together and redistribution to some extent needs to go together. Uh, at this point, I think the, the major challenge to me would be the competitiveness restructuring one so that you create more wealth. So between creating more wealth and redistributing wealth, at this point, at this juncture, I would put a higher weight on creating more wealth in a society which has gone through six years of deep recession. Now, and I finish with, uh, I don't think it would have made any difference uh, in October even if the announcement was not made. Uh, as I tried to indicate, already markets followed Greece, and they make their own projections. And that's my first lesson, that you cannot hide the figures from market participants who are there and who have the possibility of speculating against uh, your bonds or against the euro, et cetera, et cetera. So even if the announcement was not made, sooner or later the, the, the problem would have erupted. Uh, now, did we know? Yes, absolutely we knew. What, what, what uh, where I went wrong? I went wrong because I thought we had time to do a much more gradual adjustment. Uh, I was not expecting, as I said, we knew that the t it's like an earthquake. You knew that the energy was building. It was coming up. You don't know when the earthquake will come. And uh, so when... 
uh, just when we introduced both the first budget and the growth and stability fund to the commission, which was voted in January, February, it was a much more a program of consolidation, but a much more gradual program of consolidation, thinking we had time. The, but basically turned out that we did not have any time and then you could not raise any funding. So we had to go through the MOU process. Very good. We've finished on hope, and I'm going to remind you that on the 1st of February, you can go online for Act for Greece. Exactly. The uh, advertisement is behind me. Uh, can I thank the Hellenic Bankers Association for uh, the collaboration for this evening? And can I uh, do our usual thing of commemorating this uh, lecture at the LSC and uh, providing our speaker, Luca Cazzelli, with this uh, gift, which is a shield of the LSE. And the next time I come to your office, I hope to see it on your desk. <laughs> uh, but can you please thank me? Uh, thank you can you much. join me uh, in thanking our uh, oh, speaker? <laughs> thank you.